Welcome into Hitting Hard with John Chuckery here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Today on the show, the Falcons did the right thing. Also, the Falcons were never in the Lamar business. And can we have an honest discussion about the Hawks? It's all next. It's Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked On Sports Atlanta. This is Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. Hitting Hard is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. We ask you to head over to YouTube.com, put Locked On Sports Atlanta into your search browser. When you get there, hit that subscribe button. You can leave us a comment as well. Also free and available to download on all of your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your favorites. Roku and Amazon Fire, two additional ways that you can catch all of our great content and then give me a follow at JMCH316 on my personal Twitter. So yesterday, we'll talk about Lamar in just a little bit here, but the Falcons did the right thing. And I was never in the business of franchise tagging Caleb McGarry, either with the exclusive tag or the non-exclusive tag, the difference of 18, I think, 0.3 million for the exclusive the 16.6 or whatever million for the non-exclusive. I was never in that business. And I've said this consistently on the podcast, that you have to be willing to walk away from somebody, right? Like you have to be willing to walk away. And in some ways, the Falcons sent that message. Now, they've got until the 15th of the month to sign Caleb McGarry, or he becomes a free agent. So we're in this little transitional dead period and different things like that. But when you franchise a guy, no matter what tag you use or whatever like that, all of that money gets attached to your cap. All of that money is the number that is allocated for Caleb McGarry. He's not a 16 or $18 million right tackle. Sorry. Now, if I could get a deal done. Four years, $50 million, I'm all in. Okay. But I'm also not in the overpaying for Caleb McGarry business. I want Caleb McGarry. I want him to be here. I want to give him a a deal that doesn't make him a, a, a low tier guy, but certainly doesn't make him one of the higher paid guys. And I've been consistent about this all the way through. I think he's a 12 or $13 million tackle, but he's not a 16, 18 million plus dollar tackle in this league. Not when you have one good year out of four, not when you still have lots of questions about whether or not you can pass block or this, then, and the other. So I thought the Falcons did the right thing at the end of the day by not giving him the franchise tag. Now, what if you can't get a deal done? Then you go draft your next right tackle. I'm not about spending way over money, way way high tier money for even an Orlando Brown or somebody like that. I like those guys, but I'm not way over paying for one of those guys. I'll take the number eight pick in the draft and I'll go get me an offensive tackle, whether that's Broderick Jones, whether that's Paris Johnson, whether that's Skaronsky, whatever it is, whatever that pick could end up being, I'll go draft my young guy, and then I'll have, let's just argue, Paris Johnson, okay? I'll have Paris Johnson on the right side, play him for a a year or two, then I'll swap him over to the left side, and I'll make Jake come over and play right tackle, and we'll all get our offensive line figured out. And that's the message that was sent. Like I said, I want Caleb McGarry here, but you have to be willing to walk away from some of these guys rather than overspend on them and rather than get back into cap purgatory and you overspend on a particular player, whether it's Dante Fowler, you know, there are a myriad of guys that the Falcons have given free agent money to that they've way overspent on and then never gotten any value back for it. I don't want Caleb McGarry to be the next guy for all of that. 
because I still have lots of questions. And if if this offense starts to balance itself out more, where we were the only team in the NFL that called more run plays than pass plays, a majority run plays, if that balance starts to get over or we start to become a little bit more pass-oriented offense, then all of the flaws and warts that Caleb McGarry had are going to bubble up to the surface. And then where am I in two years? Then, then I'm looking for another tackle, and, 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 and I'm looking maybe for my left tackle and my right tackle. And then we go back to where we were a few years ago. So I think it was the right decision for the Atlanta Falcons, and, and hopefully that they will get a deal worked out over the next, whatever, week here. You know, by the 15th, um, where he can become a free agent. Hopefully, we'll see that. But because of not trading away all your draft picks and all this kind of stuff, okay, the Falcons have options. And and they they negotiated from a position of strength. They didn't have to pick up his $13 million fifth-year option. They didn't have to pick up his 16 to $18 million franchise tag. And because they have the eighth pick of the draft or they have – lots of draft capital that's available to them, or they have lots of free agent money, they weren't negotiating from a position of weakness. And that's the thing. That's that's where you get into trouble with players like Caleb McGarry that you feel like you have to bring them back because you can't afford to go get somebody else, or you don't have the draft capital, meaning your first round draft picks. If you trade them away for quarterbacks and stuff, you don't have that draft capital to where, okay, I'm looking around and saying, well, let's see, I can grab Jalen Mayfield in the third round. Well, how'd that work out? How'd that work out the last time you went middle rounds for your offensive lineman? How'd that work out for the Falcons? Oh, yeah? Oh, he was only the worst offensive lineman in the entire league for that year that he started? Oh, okay, well, that's great. That Where does that get my franchise? And then you start back into that cycle. The Falcons have a real strength in their offensive line. And I continue to say that you have to build off of that strength, not take steps backward, but continue to build forward. And I think Caleb McGarry, if you can lock him up, he can certainly be a a, a competent tackle for what this offense requires. And then you upgrade at left guard. Maybe you upgrade at center, but certainly you upgrade at left guard and maybe get a top-tier left guard, a Nate Davis or something like that from the Tennessee Titans. And voila, you know, you you got your strength of your offensive line, and now we can focus on quarterback or defensive line or whatever is next on the on the checklist and things like that. But the Falcons did the right thing at the end of the day. They did the move, and they negotiated from a position of strength. And look, honestly, if they weren't going to pick up his $13 million fifth-year option, they weren't going to pick up $18 million on the cap and be locked in to him to overpay that. And then if it doesn't work out, then you're right back into, you're certainly not going to pick up a second franchise tag on him. Then you're right back into, okay, we're trying to negotiate and all this, that, and the other. And, and now you're not negotiating from a position of strength anymore. So the Falcons did the right thing, not tagging McGarry. I want to see him back, but you now that you haven't made all these other crazy moves, you have options available to you. Sign a free agent, draft a guy at eight, re-sign McGarry. All of these things are on the table now that because you didn't do some things, you've put yourself in a position to bargain at strength. All right, let's talk about our friends over at FanDuel. Listen, FanDuel is America's number one sports book, and as the NBA season is starting to close down a little bit here and we're headed toward playoff action, you can buy by signing up at FanDuel.com slash locked on claim your no sweat first bet where you can get as much as $1,000 in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, super easy to use. You can bet on everything from money lines to props to everything in between. But when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on today and claim your no sweat first bet where you can get as much as $1,000 in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. And by the way, you can get a, a, a chance for a bigger payout when you combine bets with the same gate parlay. But claim your no sweat first bet at FanDuel.com slash 
locked on. FanDuel.com slash L O C K E D O N and get as much as a thousand dollars in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook betting partner of the NBA. So we got word yesterday that when the Baltimore Ravens put the you know non-exclusive franchise tag on Lamar Jackson and he got everybody's hopes up in Atlanta for about 17 or 18 seconds, I would say, okay, before Diana Russini and about 10 other people started putting out on Twitter, the Falcons were not in the business of Lamar Jackson. They're not negotiating with Lamar Jackson. And we also got word from my buddy Michael Rothstein and some others that there were never discussions at the combine in depth with Lamar Jackson, okay? Now, a couple of things. Do I think that the Falcons made contact with Lamar Jackson through back channels or calling him directly about what's going to happen or what he's really looking for? Yes. I, I think that they have contacted Lamar Jackson in some form or fashion. I know he's his own agent or whatever like that. They have contacted him in some form or way. But it isn't coincidence that you've seen multiple teams come out and say they're not in the Lamar Jackson business. Now, the other part of this is, okay, there's a, there's a couple of moving parts to all of this. Number one, this is not a discussion about is Lamar Jackson a better player than Desmond Ritter? This is, you, you can't put this thing in a neat little package in a little gift box and wrap it up and hand it to somebody and say, who's better of these two guys? That's not the discussion. Everybody knows Lamar Jackson on the field is a better player than Desmond Ritter. But when you add the draft capital and the contract and everything else that comes along with it, his injury factor, all of the different things that have to be... See, again, when you trade your football cards, right, you can make these kinds of deals. But when it comes to real money and tags and this and that and compensation, it, it, the business of football takes over. And people don't like to hear that. Well, well, Lamar Jackson's way better than what we got. Yes, but you have to give up your assets. You have to pay a whole bunch of money. And you're getting a guy who maybe is a 12-game player. He's been a 12-game player the last two years. Can you roll the dice on all of that? See, that's the little bubble that you that people live in, just saying that, well, this guy's bet player A is better than player B. Yeah, we all know that. But there are other factors that come into this. And look, here's the thing, okay? Take Deshaun Watson. He's the highest cap hit at quarterback in the NFL currently, okay? He's about $54, $55 million dollars on the cap, okay? The number two guy on the cap is uh, is Pat Mahomes, okay? At 49 something million dollars. So it's less than $6 million between the first and second quarterback that are the two biggest cap hits in the NFL. What's the difference though? Pat Mahomes is a $5.5 million base salary where if you need to massage the cap, he's got workout bonuses, he's got signing bonuses, he's got roster bonuses. You can manipulate the cap and bring that number down from 49 and a half million. You know what Deshaun Watson's base salary is this year? $46 million. So five and a half versus 46. There's no massaging that number for Deshaun Watson. And that's why he's $54 million against the cap. There's no massage in that number and change in that number up because all of his money is guaranteed. So you would have no flexibility to all of a sudden go in and massage the numbers on a Lamar Jackson contract if that's what he really wants. And look, if he's really going to stick to his guns, then don't sign the franchise tender and don't play this year. But my guess is whether he gets a new deal or not, he'll ultimately sign that $32 million tender if that's where he ends up with the Baltimore Ravens. 
Now, the other part of this is, okay, you're the Atlanta Falcons. You go in, you're willing to give up the two first round draft picks for compensation. You go in, you work a deal, you get this, you got that, bop, bada, bop, bada, bop, 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 bop. And then you put an offer sheet together. You know what the Ravens can do? Check, we're, we're, we're gonna go ahead and match this offer. And then you're left holding the bag. And then, then where are you? That Then you're back in the Deshaun Watson business because you kicked the tires on Deshaun Watson, but when you weren't willing to give up the money that was being looked at, then all of a sudden that deal falls through and it cost you Matt Ryan at that point. But still, again, you, you fall back to, well, we're, we were going to be in the Deshaun, we we're going to be in the Lamar Jackson business, but Hey, Desmond Ritter, you know, you're, you're, our, you're our option all along. Hey, you've always been our option as we were negotiating with Lamar Jackson. How's that make Desmond Ritter feel about it? That again, when they talked about his leadership and all this kind of stuff, and then they don't have the confidence in because they're in the Lamar Jackson business. See, the, the fallout to all of these things is bigger than just who's better, player A or player B. It's never that simple. And I was never in the business of Lamar Jackson. I love him as a player. I think he's a fantastic quarterback. But again, the compensation, the contract, and the fact that we're not a player away from the Super Bowl. We're not Lamar Jackson away from being a Super Bowl team. That's not happening. Because again, Lamar Jackson is not going to sack the quarterback because we still got to get better there. And we can hope and pray and wish and stuff like that. Oh, well, we got lots of cap money. Sure, that gets eaten up by Lamar Jackson with his contract. All of a sudden, all that cap money goes away because his base salary is going to be through the roof with everything. So again, the fallout of everything. Do I want to upgrade at quarterback? Yes. I I'm all for, again, I I'll take C.J. Stroud if, if he falls in their lap. Or I'm good with giving DeMar or Desmond Ritter a shot for a year. But when you look at the totality of everything, more than just player A is better than player B, when you look at the totality of everything with it, that's why teams are scared off. And by the way, there are some teams like, I know the Dolphins said they're not in, but even if the Dolphins wanted to be in the Lamar business, they can't even begin to have discussions with him until after the draft. You know why? Because they don't have a first round pick this year. And until you get through the draft and you have two first round picks again, and some teams don't even have, there are literally half a dozen teams that don't have a pick in this year's draft and some that don't have picks in the next year's draft. You can't even negotiate from that standpoint. There's no need to talk about Lamar Jackson if you're the Miami Dolphins, because until after the draft, you don't have a first, you have a first round pick this year. So you're, you're negotiating off your 24 and 25 picks. So many moving parts to these things. This is the business of football. We may not like it, but it's the business aspect of it. And it's never more than just, well, player A is better than player B. We all know that. But unlike trading your bubblegum cards and things like that, there has to be a lot more that's worked out with everything. All right, let's talk about our friends over at Built Bar. Listen, Built Bar... We're trying to all get healthier, right? For the beginning of the year, we're trying to eat healthier. We're looking for low sugar, low carb, low calorie snacks, but we want the high protein content, right? Built Bar's got you covered. Whether you check out the marshmallow, uh, the protein infused marshmallow puffs, and they've got new flavors coming out every month, or you go the traditional protein bar route, you can go to built.com today and take a look at their extensive menu of all of the different product lines that they have. But now you can also head over to Walmart in the pharmacy section and check out and get you a box of Built Bars, or you can go to Sam's Club and get you a box of Built Bars. So whether you go the brick and mortar route or go online to Built.com, check them out today. They've got all of your snacks as we're all trying to get healthier, but you can go to Built.com, Sam's Club, now Walmart as well. So can we have an honest discussion about the Atlanta Hawks and, and where we're at right now, because this thing is starting to fade away a little bit here, okay? Right now, the Atlanta Hawks 
are way more likely to be the 9-10 seed than they are to get to six. Brooklyn won last night. They've won three in a row. They're not going to be as bad as what we thought. The Wizards won last night. So here's how it's setting up right now for the Atlanta Hawks, okay, who play tonight in Washington, okay? If you lose tonight to Washington, you are in a tie record-wise with the Wizards. And at this point, you will have not won the season series because you'll be 0-2. So as far as for right now, you don't have the tiebreaker over the uh, Washington Wizards. And the Raptors play in L.A. tonight. They play the Clippers in L.A. tonight, okay? So maybe the Clippers can get a win, but the Raptors are only half a game behind. So theoretically, if the Raptors didn't even play and you would lose to Washington, you'd be either tied with the Raptors and then you'd be tied with the Wizards. Miami right now is two and a half games ahead of the Hawks in the seventh seed. And the Nets right now are five games ahead in the sixth seed with 17 to play for the Atlanta Hawks. If we're being real, there is no chance right now that the Hawks are, they're, they're not going to make up five games over two teams to get to the sixth seed. That ain't happening. They are more likely to be the 9-10 seed and they're going to have to hang on for dear life just to get to the eighth seed. And this is where we're at by not taking advantage of the schedule. You know, and again, if they lose tonight, this is more than just the coach. This is more than just having a head coach, coaching change and getting the bump for all of that, right? It's a matter of that the Hawks have been one of the more disappointing franchises in the NBA this year. And things are starting to go sideways. You lose tonight, at best you're going to be one and three on this road trip. And then you get Boston on a back-to-back, -back, Friday, Saturday. Well, the Hawks are two and seven in back-to-back -back games on the, on the back end of a back-to-back. -back. And we talked about this last week. Everything right now for the schedule is not setting up very well. The only thing that has helped you out is the Raptors are going to be on the West Coast. So they just lost the other night to Denver. They play the Clippers. Then they play the Lakers. So they're on the West Coast. So hopefully that, you know, that trip will not work out very well for the Raptors. But this is way more likely now that the Hawks are going to sit in that 9-10 seed. And now it's a matter of now you got to win two playing games, right? If you're, depending on where you're at, 9-10, you'll have one game either at home or on the road in the play-in tournament. And then if you win that game, you got to go on the road to the loser of the 7-8 seed. But this idea that, oh, well, you know, we're still in the, the six, brother, that is out the window. That, that whole six seed discussion isn't even a viable discussion. Two teams in front of you, five games to make up with 17 to play, and you're not good on the road, and you're not good in back-to-backs, and guess where you're at tonight and on Friday and then Saturday at home against one of the best teams in the NBA, who, by the way, has a three-game losing streak going right now. You don't think that they're trying to get back on track? to try to get up and catch Milwaukee. And oh yeah, I mean, by the way, Middleton just played his most minutes of the year last night and was outstanding. So the Bucks are rolling right along and the Celtics are trying to get back on a winning track. You think that they're going to lose on Saturday night to Atlanta coming here and they've got it. They, they're kind of in, I don't want to say desperation mode, but they know that they've only got a, a handful of games left to try to make up some ground in the standings. This is an honest discussion about where we're at for this year. You may not like it. You know, it's not the most pleasant thing. It's not, not fun and games and lollipops and sugar plums and waterfalls and rainbows. But this is the hole that this team has dug. And do not think for one minute 
that the owner of this team is looking at trying to be a 9-10 seed. Clint Capella said last week, we're trying to get up to the 6 seed. Okay? Well, you've got two teams you got to jump. One of the teams you've already lost your season series to, Miami. You, you, don't, you haven't won the season series, so you're not going to get that tiebreaker. And you've got five games to make up against two teams with 17 left to play. This has been an enormously frustrating season. And we have talked about this. The only thing consistent about the Atlanta Hawks has been their complete lack of inconsistency. Yeah, the schedule set itself up coming off the All-Star break. You had a bunch of days off. You had the Cavs at home. Cavs are not a very good road team. Hawks have been at least decent at home. Yeah, everything's set up. Yeah, Portland on Friday night. Absolutely. You were going to win that game because they were coming west to east. They played the played a, a night before that in their home court and were coming all the way to the east coast. They were going to stay another night in Atlanta rather than go down to Orlando, and it was the start of their trip. That's taking advantage of the schedule. You didn't do that at the end of the calendar year last year. So if we're being honest, okay, if we're, we're going to have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion about where this Hawks team is, and you can say, that, oh, it's 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 about the future and all that kind of stuff. Tony Wrestler ain't thinking about – Tony Wrestler didn't pay premium money for a coach just to evaluate later on. He brought them in three-quarters of the way through the season because they still want to win right now. They want to win now. They pay top-tier money to bring a coach in to sit on the bench three-quarters of the way through the season. That ain't evaluating because you could have done – you didn't have to add the extra year onto the contract. You didn't have to bring him in three-quarters of the way through. You could have signed him and said, hey, you know what? Joe Prunty will coach the rest of the way. Joe Prunty will coach the, the rest of the season, and it'll be okay. You didn't have to do any of those things, but they brought him in. Because, again, what were you going to learn in a 20-game sample size? Really and truly, what were you really going to learn in a 20-game sample size? All the same things that we already knew, that this is a bigger problem than just a head coach? So this idea of the six seed, hasta lasagna, don't get any on you. I'm just hoping that the Hawks can hang in because Chicago, Indiana, those teams are trash. Hopefully the Hawks can just stay at the eight seed when all is said and done and then get in that play-in game to where if they win, they're in the first round in the seven seed. But if they lose, they'll have another shot at it. That's reality for the Atlanta Hawks. All right, we thank you so much for making Hitting Hard with John Chuck for your first listen today. Make sure you make Locked On Sports today your second listen. Biggest stories of the day, instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available Odyssey, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your favorite podcast from. We ask you to head over to YouTube.com, put Locked On Sports Atlanta into your search browser. When you get there, hit that subscribe button. Be part of our ever-growing communities. We're headed towards 6,000 folks. You can also leave us a comment there. We are free and available to download on all of your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your favorites, check us out there. We are also available on Roku and Amazon Fire, so two additional ways that you can get all of our content. And then give me a follow on my personal Twitter page, at JMCH316. Back with you tomorrow. This has been Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked on Sports Atlanta. 